This is about a baby. This is my it. life on the line. It is. If he was to fall from a step like that, maybe he did fall from a step like that, but a lot more happened before that. Yeah, because y'all was sitting up here calling me a monster and shit, and I know I ain't no monster. Yeah. I did nothing. Well, well, somebody did something, and you're like the I said, I had nine kids in that house, in my kitchen, cooking for nine kids when he got pushed. And I reacted okay. like a parent should act. Yep, I'm not disputing that at all. All right, it didn't happen when he fell off the damn 18-inch step, Brian. Well, I know I didn't touch that baby, and I didn't do nothing wrong to that baby. Then who did it? This is 37-year-old Bryant Roland Jr., a resident of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and a father of seven children. Bryant appears to be a dependable and honest guy. However, this is merely a facade. The reality is quite the opposite. On August 23, 2017, Brian's wife, Brandy Rowland, was contacted by Desiree Downey to inquire if they could look after her two children for the night. 11-month-old Jason and his five-year-old brother were Brian's nephews. Around 11.30 a.m., Desiree finalized the plans with Brian through text message to have him care for two of her three children while she ran errands in Lansing for a few hours. She dropped off the two children with Brian and entrusted the third child to his father. Bryant was the sole adult caregiver that night, watching over his two nephews, 11-month-old Jason and his older brother at his home in the 700 block of West Vine Street in Kalamazoo. Additionally, he was responsible for his own seven children while his wife was away at work. However, emergency services were called to the residence around 10.20 p.m. Officers arrived at the apartment shortly after 10.30 p.m. in response to a seizure experienced by baby Jason. He was transported to Bronson Methodist Hospital, where he tragically passed away four days later on August 27, 2017, succumbing to a series of injuries. This is where it started getting shady. Bryant gave two versions of the incident, however neither of them aligned with the evidence and the witnesses. As per the police report, a physician at Bronson stated that Jason had sustained multiple injuries inconsistent with a single short fall from the top of a three-step staircase. The doctor noted that Jason had experienced non-accidental head trauma. This report straight away indicated negligence on Bryant's part and raised concerns about the possibility of abuse. Let's watch how detectives handle an alleged child abuser in this interrogation. Roland, do you remember me? No, maybe not a trick question. Myself and uh, Bill were the guys who talked to you last time, probably. Months ago. Well, yeah, whenever, I don't even remember when it was. I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head. So, um, did you get a chance to chat with Bill yet or no? Nope. Did these guys tell you what you're here for? No, I do not. They, they, I not. just went down there reporting and all of a sudden, police were there. Okay, where were you reporting at? Um, right there behind the county building at my probation office. Okay. Oh. What do you want paper for? For um, long as it's all. Okay. All right. Was that something that happened since you and I talked the first time? I don't remember you being on paper. Yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, are you still living at the same house? Where are you staying at? I can't, um, I don't know. Okay. 1509. Okay. Apartment three. Okay. 15 of the Fox Ridge? Yeah. Well, I'm sure you got some questions for me as to, you know, why you're here. Mm. Um, I got some questions for you. Um, do you, did they, did you get a chance yet to get anything to drink or? Well, these two? Yeah. All right. I'll get you some water. I'll be right back in here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will. Get you some water or something, Bernard? It's Brian. Brian. Oh, sorry. What did I say, Bernard? Um, you need some, some water? water? That's, 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 that's right. That's right. That's right. exactly right. what I did. You need some water? Something to drink? Water? Yeah. Okay. Cup of water. Okay. All right. I'll grab my notepad. I'll be right in. Okay. Uh, the other, the other bald guy. But he, he knows your cousin. Is that? I guess cause he keep calling me Bernard, and that's not me. <laughs> Who's Bernard? My cousin. Cousin Bernard. Roland. Okay. Mm. No, no. All right. Well, if they're, I'll get you food and water. I guess I'll wait for them so we can repeat ourselves. So, what else been going on? You been working anywhere today? Nope. Just got relieved from the county two weeks ago. Yeah. You been in there for how long? 
almost four months. Okay, on the felonious assault, as you said, and now you're on probation for it. What was the what was the deal with that case? Me and my wife. On August 23rd, 2017, the night of the incident, both the detectives interviewed Bryant for the first time. Almost two months after the incident, the second interview takes place in this interrogation room based on some inconsistencies that were detected. There are two things to keep in mind. First, the forensic reports didn't match Bryant's narrative. Second, Bryant's own son, who he claimed was the sole witness of Jason's so-called accident, denied witnessing anything. In the last part of the clip, Bryant mentions being in probation for the charges of domestic abuse in a very subtle way. However, his behavior was not so subtle. He kept his posture relaxed as if the charges meant nothing. He had a history of violence that was known to the people who knew him. During the investigation, police spoke with a witness who mentioned Brian's violent side. She mentioned witnessing the way he treated his children, often hitting them and abusing them in public. So it's safe to say that the man sitting in this chair is very different from how he wants to portray himself. Let's dig in deeper. When he got physical and I got locked up for it, Gotcha. Oh, is that why you're not living over there anymore, probably? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's still staying there? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. And brace the hair in my dang leg. What, they got a GPS tether? Yeah. Do you got to pay for that? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Jim and Dane told me I had to pay nothing yet, so. Now, how does that work? Do you have a thing at your house where you're supposed to not be within X amount of feet or? Nope, all I got is a, just a charger at the house, just to charge it. So you don't, you can go wherever, there's no? Mm-hmm. Uh, they monitor it over there at the um, probation office. I only go out from 8 to oh, 12. Oh, over on Haley Street talking? Yeah. yeah. Eight, there's no, you can go wherever as far as within your house. Thank you you walk yeah. something like that. All right, guys. Oh, you want, no, go ahead, John. You're good. Give, give me a shout if he needs anything else. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, so no, no restrictions on where you can or can't go. Yeah, I can't go to my wife's house. Oh, okay. Because of the, uh, I was just asking him if he knew what's going on here. He said he was at his uh, PO's office and they brought him down here. Okay. Um. So I uh, figured out what uh, what he had going out with. He said he's on uh, probation, a tether, GPS tether from a, a different case. Okay, that probation thing. So what? Uh, yeah. Um. So anyways, like I said, I know you got some questions for me as to why you're here. Um. And and Bill too. Um. Did like you said? Did you remember Bill? Do you remember him from the first one? That's why. So he said he didn't. No. No. Okay. I guess some. Maybe it's the voice with me. No, your face you can't forget. My face. Well, I was nice too, wasn't I? Yeah, a little bit there. A little bit there. All right. Well, uh, you mean green card? You you go ahead. Yeah. Or do you? Are you no. Go ahead. Oh, um, like I was saying, uh, with you being here, all right, and um, Bill and I talking to you, you got brought to your probation officer. You went in there. What? To check in like you normally would, is that correct? Yeah, I didn't even go see her. I went to go see my Swift and Sure lady today. And what's that? But um, it's a new program that they can did where I got to call every day and drop and take classes and stuff. Okay, like a deferment type thing. Is that if you don't mess up within X amount of time, then they mm -hmm. get it off your? No, it don't come off my record. But well, what's the point of doing it then? They make you check in and do all this stuff and there's no benefit? I get off, I'm supposed to get off in 18 months. Oh, you get off soon. Okay, okay. so that's what the... But, okay. And if I, if I f*** up, then I go to prison. Okay. So. Oh. All right, so you're there doing that. Police come pick you up. Yep. And, and no okay. covers. Go ahead. Nope. My probation officer came in and was like, um, I need you to stand up and do what the officer said. And I was like, okay, well, what's going on? She was like, well, I can't tell you, but... I come and see you in the county in like a day or two. So that's where I thought I was headed to. Like she put out a violation on me, so. Okay, all right. All right, well, we can we can go over that uh, as far as what we have on that. Um, but like I said, I have some questions for you. You probably have some questions for me as to why you're here. Um, with that in mind, obviously, you didn't come here on your own free will, right? You got brought down here uh, by the police in handcuffs. 
So whenever I talk to someone that's down here, uh, it, it comes up against, you know what I mean? Like the first time you came here, you walked in. This time, since someone brought you here, I'm gonna advise your rights. You understand that? Okay, you've been read your rights before. Is that something you're familiar with? All right. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk with a lawyer, have him or her present with you before or during any questioning. If you want a lawyer but cannot afford to hire one, one will be appointed to represent you at public expense. Do you understand each of these rights that I've explained to you? Yes, I do. So far, Brian has been able to keep a straight face and hinted quite a few times that as far as the possible charges are concerned, he assumes it came from his wife for violating his probation rules. Although Brian attempts to be perceived as nonchalant, his leg movement suggests otherwise. In terms of the detectives, the first detective initially establishes the power dynamic in the room, while the second detective takes a more engaging approach. Initially, in the first few minutes of the interrogation, Brian is left uncertain as to why he's there, as they do not provide him with the reason behind his arrest. This is often strategically done to increase the anxiety in suspects. Um, and you said uh, you're living at Fox Ridge, you're on Tether, you're not working right now, that's all correct? Is there a good phone number to get a hold of you at? Yeah, he, my cell phone is down there, but I just got the phone, so I ain't got to know the number. Okay. I don't know the number to it right now. Okay. All right. Well, with this in mind, you want to talk to me now, answer some questions? All right. There's some stuff you don't know. Was it a, know. Was it a yes? Yeah, yes? Yeah, yes. Okay. If there's something you don't know, then you don't know. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's nothing out of the ordinary here uh, as far as... If you don't know something, you don't know something. I'm not trying to trick you, all right? Um, Bill, what do you got there? Well, do you know why you're in custody right now? Okay. All I know is she said, say that I have a, she put out a probation hold on me. Okay. So I know. Well, the, <clears throat> the reason for the probation hold is um, there has been an issue, a warrant issue for your arrest, okay? And, now, I never, I never lied to you in here. I don't plan that. Jazz not gonna lie to you in here either. Okay, but there's been a warrant issued for your arrest. Okay, for felony murder. Okay. Note the change in Bryant's posture and expression as the detective mentions the charges behind his arrest. Bryant had earlier assumed that he had been marked innocent by the detective after his first interview when the incident happened. Thus, this sudden arrest based on the charges of felony murder has caught him off guard. However, he quickly gets himself together and laughs it off. He attempts to establish the power dynamic in his favor and maintain an aggressive approach, which is quite concerning when it comes to cases involving minors. Typically, individuals involved in harmful activities, especially against children, often strive to project an image of innocence and gentleness. They maintain a calm demeanor, aiming to appear as individuals without a history of violence or abuse who are cooperative with detectives. Take, for instance, John T. Harris, a 26-year-old from Jacksonville, Florida, charged with first-degree murder and child neglect in the tragic death of five-year-old Zakaria. During his interrogation, he portrayed himself generously, adopting a soft demeanor. Check out the full video, link attached in the description box. You gotta be kidding me. No. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. So that's why we're here. Okay. There's some there's some questions that you might this is your last opportunity, Brian, to to get your side out there. Otherwise, like I you've heard me say this before, okay? You don't want this this boy's autopsy and the pictures of his autopsy to to say your side of the story because you're gonna end up being the loser. All right, something happened that day, and I can tell you right now what the doctor said. The the amount of injury that boy had, and I have the I have all the paperwork right here. Look at the actual autopsy is dating near longer than the actual police report. Okay. And the amount of injury, and I had separate interviews with these doctors, okay? The amount of injury that this boy sustained was astronomical. And it didn't, and it was, it, it's absolutely impossible that the injury that he obtained, sustained in your house that day, came from falling down an 18 damn inch step. In the interrogation of Bryant, careful observations reveal distinct behavioral cues and strategic considerations. Initially, Bryant's laughter upon learning about the charges of felony murder is indicative of a defense mechanism. He attempts to project an image of fearlessness, potentially as a means to convince others, including the detectives, that he is not intimidated by the serious charges he faces. 
The detectives, particularly Detective Stolzenberg, observe Bryant's challenging demeanor. Recognizing Bryant's arrogance and rough behavior as potential defenses, Detective Stolzenberg decides not to adopt a slow or cautious approach. This strategic choice is rooted in the understanding that allowing Bryant to firmly cling to his defenses could complicate the interrogation process. Instead, Stolzenberg immediately takes an assertive approach by pointing out the evidence stacked against Bryant. This approach aims to disrupt Bryant's defensive posture early in the interrogation. By directly addressing the evidence, Stolzenberg signals to Bryant that attempts to deflect or deny may not be as effective. This strategic move is a calculated effort to challenge Bryant's narrative and his behavior from the outset, setting the tone for a more proactive and potentially impactful interrogation process. I, got, I told you my story. I know it, and then it changed. I, I know it, and then it changed. Yeah, because y'all was sitting up here calling me a f***ing monster and shit, and I know I ain't no f***ing monster. Mm -hmm. I did nothing. Well, well, somebody did something, and you're like the only I, I had nine kids in that house, in my kitchen, cooking for nine kids when he got pushed. And I reacted okay. like a parent should act. Yep, I'm not disputing that at all. I'm not disputing and that part I at all. And here, and I got y'all telling me I'm all types of f***ing monsters and shit. I'm not, I'm, not I'm, not I'm not disputing that that what you did was wrong there at all. If he was to fall from a step like that, maybe he did fall from a step like that, but a lot more happened before that, Brian, a lot more. And then- Man, I'm not the one that y'all need to be looking at. This all types of shit all on Facebook. My wife sending, people sending my wife messages and shit talking about how this girl is poisoning her fucking kids. And there was no, listen, uh, here's the autopsy. There's no damn poison in the body here, okay? Th that was done. That was all? Yeah. And, and, and what, that, there's no poison. Yeah, and from what CPS is telling my wife, that shit, the autopsy really ain't safe about me that i did nothing but the autopsy doesn't specifically uh, i know it don't, it don't say oh what brian rolling no it doesn't it, it, it's the autopsy is a separate a separate report that it doesn't it doesn't prove it doesn't show guilt or it doesn't try to steer anything anyway all it does is report facts that it sees okay that's it now like like we told you that night you're probably under a lot of stress at the time you're watching all these damn kids. And, and you got I'm going to do something to a baby. Well, to you've, done, baby. It you've done it before. I've done what before? What have I done? Like 13 years ago when you were babysitting that, your girlfriend's uh, child while she was at work. You beat the hell out of that. I beat no hell out of no I, saw, I had the pictures. I, said, I don't care about the pictures. I have witnesses right there in that house that, that set up there and justified it that's why when the detectives talked to me there wasn't nothing else brought up on that because they talked to all the witnesses i didn't do nothing to that child okay she was just mad because i didn't want to with her no more that's all that was and she sat up there and lied so she me. beat her that's kid. same thing Hold that on. same thing she can set up there and told her people and all her family so she beat her up there and that shit man i ain't did nothing to no kid <laughs> that's but bullshit. man i ain't even that's that's fine. Fine. i'm not accusing you of that i'm just saying what the report you is no i'm it, talking it, the kid 13 years well, ago. Well, you're right. I mean, you I'm did just yeah, you're right. say that. I'll agree with that. that fucking kid. I'll agree with that. Okay. I did not touch that kid not one time. My grandmother and auntie and my older cousin. Well, somebody Everybody did. was in that fucking house and everybody set up. Brian, somebody somebody did while you were watching the kid, okay? I, I, that's I didn't, I didn't on do that. nothing. Okay, that's fine. Let's move on to this one then, okay? Now, this one's a little more serious because the kid's dead, all right? In the interrogation, Detective Stolzenberg skillfully highlights the severity of little Jason's injuries, marked as non-accidental trauma in the autopsy report, suggesting Bryant's involvement. In response, Bryant adopts an aggressive stance, exhibiting defensiveness with each incriminating detail, evident in his elevated pitch and confrontational posture. This heightened defensiveness suggests that Bryant becomes increasingly resistant as the detective shows him that they are already aware of who is responsible for this tragedy. An escalation happens when Detective Stolzenberg introduces Bryant's history of violence, dating back 13 years. Rather than showing remorse or an attempt to explain the change in behavior, Bryant's aggression intensifies. Ironically, he seems unaware that his violent and aggressive responses in the interrogation are working against him. This lack of self-awareness highlights a potential blind spot in Bryant's perception, as his actions contradict the image he might be attempting to project. Yes, it is. Now, I'm not, I don't want to sit in here and argue with you. I want to sit in here and find out why, okay? Um, you got my story from six months ago. Yep. And that's what happened. So, something more happened. Something else happened. Because the kid, the, the medical report states there's no way he arrived at your house with those injuries. It's impossible, Brian. It's impossible. 
He sustained those injuries after he arrived at your home at 3 p.m. Okay? Okay, well, if that's what it proved, then the prosecutor been had that um, autopsy report, what, for, what, like three, almost four months? Why all of a sudden now? Because like, they, like, they set up there, like, like CPS set up there and had told me, not this new CPS, not that Michelle. I can't control how long it takes them to review something. Like, it's not like, like, like she set up there and said that the autopsy wasn't saying nothing, that it, that it was coming down to sure. the medical examiners. Sure. And I and can't I control nothing, I so. can't control how long a report is being reviewed at the prosecutor's office. John and I can't control any of that. Okay? We can only control what we can only control. Just like you can only control what you can only control. And you have a little bit of control right now. Because I always got control. I deal with seven I mean, I mean, in, in your fate time. here. A little bit of control on your fate here, okay? For what? You trying to send me to prison for something that I didn't do? I'm not do? trying to send you to prison. The, the last thing that anybody wants as a detective to do is to send the wrong person to jail. It's a absolute yeah, worst so. thing. What, what do I benefit from it? Nothing. What do I benefit? What would we benefit from doing that? Nothing. I you think they're going to get a bonus if somebody goes to prison? What am I supposed to do? Sit up here and tell y'all a f***ing lie that I did from this baby and I didn't do nothing? When I'm sitting up here in my kitchen cooking for nine kids when this sh happened? I'm not saying that. It, 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 wasn't, it didn't happen right then. It, 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 it was a series of things that occurred, okay? All right? It didn't happen when he fell off the damn 18-inch step, Brian. There's no way around that. It did not happen while you were cooking food, and he got pushed, supposedly pushed by his four-year-old brother. Didn't happen. It's not feasible. Well, I know I didn't touch that baby, and I didn't do nothing wrong to that baby. Then who did? And that's a good question, because I didn't do nothing. But it happened when he was there. Okay, like I said, I had nine kids in that house that day. Nine of them. I'm cooking for nine kids. I didn't, all the kids that were there can tell you that, that was running around the house can say seven, not nine. No, it was seven, because I had, no, no I had my seven there, and then plus J.C. and his brother. It was a total of seven, because two years weren't there. No. Yes. No. One, uh, oh no, matter of fact, it was a total of eight, because my oldest son, which is 13, he wasn't there, but the rest of them was there. Yeah, all from 12 on down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there, sure, there wasn't nobody missing but one kid, so actually not nine, there was eight kids. It's this fine. It's, it's the matter. one number doesn't matter, but here's the thing. The kid arrives, he's fine, okay? Man, when that kid arrived, when listen, that kid arrived, that, that kid was not fine, man. That kid, what was wrong? What was wrong? The kid was already shaking like he was cold and all this shit. We can sit up there and told you that shit. In the course of the interrogation, Detective Stoltzenberg persistently emphasizes the crucial timeline detail that Jason was healthy without any injuries when dropped off at 3 p.m. on August 23, 2017. This repeated emphasis serves as a strategic move to elicit specific responses and gauge Bryant's reactions. The consistent pressure from the detective has a visible impact as Bryant becomes increasingly agitated. Bryant's defensive response is noteworthy, as he vehemently denies any involvement in the injuries sustained by little Jason. Instead, he attempts to shift blame onto the child's mother. This divisionary tactic aligns with a common pattern observed among perpetrators of cases involving minors. By deflecting responsibility and projecting the blame onto someone else, in this case, the mother, Bryant aims to create a narrative that positions him as a more bystander caught in an unfortunate situation. He also emphasizes the fact that he was a father to seven kids who were healthy and fine. However, it's possible that parents with a higher number of children experience increased stress, which can lead to instances of outrage or neglect. According to the Child Welfare Information Gateway, factors such as having younger parents, belonging to a family with a higher number of children, and being in a family with a child under age one are also identified as predictors of neglect. And you know that me and my cousin and everybody, and you don't, but you don't want to believe you, him. You, you talk to his cousin. What? Detective. What? Y'all don't want to believe it because he's my family or something? Like, I'm just no. going to have somebody lie for you me? This is about a baby. You didn't document that report? This is about a baby. This is my fucking life on the line. It is. So what? John, you talk to your cousin. Now, if this would have been a grown man or something, then like, we, we probably would have had problems. But this is a baby. As much as I love and, kids in this fucking... And you, know, and you know what? The doctors are going to say on the stand, there is no way that this kid could have lasted 
six hours. Well, how did he do it? Well, how did he do it? Because it seemed like he was fine injuries. until he got pushed so he off the stairs. He ha it happened inside of your home. Okay, and so you tell me there there wasn't no time from the time that he arrived until all of a sudden when he got pushed off the stairs, what, about a half hour, hour later, that's when he started sitting up there having the so-called seizure, and I didn't even know that that's what the f*** that was because he was sleeping and he was stretching like he was like a baby stretch when they moved. So I didn't know what the f*** was going on. So you telling me that it couldn't have lasted that long? So whatever happened, it should have happened like earlier that day, right? That's so whenever, whenever this That's shit is going on, it's going to happen, right? I, I, I wish I knew because... Because then, the only thing that I know is that he got pushed off the stairs. But there was... <laughs> there was so much more than that. It, it, it's just, it's not how it happened. In the interrogation, Bryant's behavior and demeanor emerges potentially damning evidence against him. His psychological profile suggests characteristics of narcissism, where his primary concern seems to be self-preservation, displaying a callous disregard for the well-being of the 11-month-old baby, Jason. The phrase, this isn't about a baby, this is about my life, uttered by Bryant, elicits discomfort among the two detectives. This statement starkly reveals Bryant's skewed priorities and a lack of empathy toward the infant's life. The observation indicates a troubling aspect of Bryant's character, his apparent indifference about the baby's death and the justice he deserves. Given that he is the father of seven children, such a self-centered and callous attitude is not only undesirable, but deeply concerning. The detective's discomfort in response to Bryant's prioritization of his own life over the tragic incident involving the baby underlines the stark contrast in values and highlights a significant hurdle in their pursuit of justice. This psychological insight into Bryant's mindset becomes a crucial element for the detectives to navigate as they seek to unravel the truth behind the baby's injuries. Bryant, he arrives. He's fine, all right? When he's there, your cousin's there, his girl's there. He's fine for a while. He is a normal baby. At some point throughout the course of that day when he's there with you, throughout those hours, something happens to him beyond just falling down the stairs. Kids fall, kids get pushed. I mean, you got, how many kids your own? Seven? They don't die from that. Not from an 18 inch, you know what I'm saying? They don't die I from know. an 18 inch step. So what more happened between that time frame? Like I said, nothing. There's, there's pieces of the puzzle that are not being filled here. I mean, what it comes down to is the kids in your care, um, the, medical doctor that reviews the case reviews the autopsy and, and looks it over says, okay, well, this is something that's out of the scope of that, you know, of a baby falling 18 inches. This is um, actual real physical damage that happened to this kid. So you can't fill in the blanks as to what happened. I mean, it's just kind of hard to swallow. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a hard one to say, well, you know, he's got a lot of kids in there. And I get that there's a lot of kids and that's a ton of stress, but you got to know what's going on. My kids don't stress me out. Not eight kids wouldn't stream. <laughs> Come on, man. I couldn't do it. I'll be honest with no you. No way. There's a lot of children. I love my babies, too. I don't doubt we that. We do yeah, all man. types of stuff together. Right. We, we, we got more fun and, than anything. And most people love their kids, of course. And that's so just like, I'm not saying you don't. I can babysit at other people's kids, and, and you can ask. They can, just like when this go to court and all that, they all gonna be there to tell you, hey, I watched their kids. They kids, they never said I sat up there and got loud with them, got physical with none of my kids, no nothing. Because after this happened, everybody got the question in their kids. And all, it all came back, hey, my kid ain't said you this, my kid ain't said you that. So what was different about this day? It was an ordinary day to me. Until what happened, though? And until he got pushed, and I called his mom and told him what happened. Okay. And she was like, oh, well, get him ready because I'm finna come get him anyway. What, what did he act like after he got pushed? When you went out there to tend to him, what did, what did he act like? And he was sitting up there like, he was like hesitating to scream because it's like it hurt it so bad. So I made him a bottle and we sat there in the chair for a minute. He drunk some of that damn bottle and we sat up there and I was rocking him like this and he started dozing off. I laid him on my bed, went in there to finish making the food and to fix the rest of the kid's plate. And when I came back, I said, let me move him so he don't fall off this bed. And I scooted him up and that's when he flinched like a kid would do it when you wake him up out there sleep or something. Mm -hmm. And I put him in the middle of my bed and I made everybody else place. Then I went back and got him and put him in the car seat. And that's when he started doing that. And my wife was on the way home. And she came in and noticed that it was seizures. 
why didn't you call 911? Because I didn't know. You didn't know. During the interrogation, Bryant introduces a narrative claiming that the baby hesitated to scream out of pain, a statement that, if accurate, would raise concerns about the severity of Jason's condition. However, the detectives quickly identify a critical inconsistency. If the baby was in genuine pain, Bryant's failure to immediately call 911 becomes highly negligent. This observation highlights a lapse in Bryant's reasoning and raises questions about the authenticity of his account. Moreover, the detectives, particularly Detective Mason, keenly point out the inconsistencies in Bryant's narrative. Bryant's attempt to adhere to his false version of events, attributing Jason's injuries to a fall from an 18-inch staircase, underscores the significance of the detective's persistent push for the truth. These observations show crucial insights into Bryant's actions and awareness during the incident. The detective's scrutiny not only exposes potential fabrications, but also echoes concerns about negligence and a lack of understanding, raising doubts about the credibility of Bryant's account. Additionally, the linkage to the detective's earlier suspicion of Bryant having an aggressive outburst suggests a pattern of behavior that requires further exploration in the pursuit of uncovering the actual circumstances surrounding Jason's injuries. I thought he was just stretching, and my wife came in and she was like, Junior, how long has he been doing it? I said, about good. I just put him in his car seat, so he did it as soon as I put him in his car seat. And she had just walked through the door. I'm trying to rationalize my head. I'm trying to uh, envision myself. It's, this is just really hard to believe. I know I didn't put my hands on that baby. I didn't do nothing wrong to that baby. Okay, so now, let's, what about when you fell down the steps with it? Okay. Explain that. What time, what, what point was, did that happen? How many hours Early before? Earlier today? That was uh, what, like, maybe an hour or so after he got there. But while we're just discussing all this, that didn't come up at all. When, when, you were, when John asked you, well, what happened? Maybe, why didn't you bring that up? Because I figured you already told everybody I told you the story. Right. Or, right, but I'm just asking, I'm asking you, I don't care if you told Bill, like, I'm just trying to figure out because what, what he else. Fell, he fell, he wasn't red, he had no red mark, he had no lumps, no bruises, no nothing on him. So he fell down how many, no, I'm remembering your steps, they go up and then they go up again. What parts did you fall down? The, the, the first slight right there. So like right when you walk out of your, your house, your bedroom there, that first portion? Yes. And then and where that did you go? Earlier you, in the day. Did you go over and under the grass then or the dirt? No, nope, just the balance they cause. Oh, okay. So you fall to there, and how were you holding him at the time you fall? I was holding him like he's supposed to hold him. I had him one arm like this, and he was holding on to my shirt like this. Okay. And you just tripped and, and fell? No. Well, I, I just passed out. Oh, from what? I got a habit of passing out. I did not know that. Um, all right, so you pass out. My body gets overheated and... In the initial interview after the incident, Bryant had provided a different narrative, stating that he fell down the stairs while holding Jason. When detectives confront him with this inconsistency during the subsequent interrogation, there is a noticeable change in his expression. This moment marks a direct confrontation where the detectives reveal their awareness of the conflicting information provided by Bryant. It's a classic technique employed by detectives to trap suspects with their own stories and the misinformation they create. The change in Bryant's expression suggests a moment of realization or discomfort as he is confronted with the inconsistency in his accounts. Detectives strategically use this technique to challenge the credibility of Bryant's version of events, making it clear that they are scrutinizing the details closely. By pointing out the conflicting narratives, the detectives aim to create pressure and elicit more accurate information from Bryant, who may now feel compelled to address the disparities in his story. You wake up? I mean, how long are you passed out for? Not that long, because I don't know, because my son was waking me up. Okay. Which son is this? My five-year-old. Okay. So you pass out, you're not sure how long you're out for? What couldn't have been that long. You have an estimate? I mean, I have no idea. I have no gauge of this. Is it, are we talking five seconds, five minutes, five hours? Maybe a possible of a minute. Okay. When you wake up, what's the baby doing? Crying. Okay. And I guess... Do you have clarity at that point in time as to what the heck's going on or anything? Or uh, I sat there and it was started coming back, but I can hear him crying. Okay. So I picked him up, examined him. He didn't have no lumps, no bruises on him, no nothing. 
Where was he laying in relation to you on the like landing? Up under him when I when we fell, it's like I landed on top of him a little bit. Okay. So when you woke up from falling, uh, when you come to, when your five year old wakes you up, how are you laying? What position on your stomach, on your back, on your side? Like my stomach. Okay, so you're on your so stomach. I was on top of him. The baby, so the baby's underneath you or around where? Would you say stomach, About knees, and the stomach area. Okay. Because my my legs and shit was all on a balancer. What's a balancer? Banister. Oh, the yeah. The the real, yeah really? Okay. Got you. So your legs are up on that. Um, baby's underneath you. You hear him crying when you wake up, right? Is that correct? And then he doesn't have anything, no bruises, no nothing? He wasn't bleeding, no nothing. It was just wood, right, if I remember correctly? No splinters, no nothing. No. And you had nothing, no injury? No, I had a little scrape, that was it. And okay. it wasn't even a scrape. Do you remember that first night we talked to you in here? The night it happened. He never, ever, ever, never mentioned that. We asked if even that even happened. We, John and I asked you, did you fall down the stairs? Did JCM fall down the stairs? You said, no, no, it didn't happen. I mean, this, that's why it's so, it's so, it, we're, we're, we're struggling here with this. That's why, okay? You feel me? We're struggling with it. Because let's say he did fall down the steps like that. Okay, that's not gonna do it either. That won't. It, it won't. That's just like you sat up there and told me yep. that I could throw him. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. measured it. I measured it. A seventeen and a half feet. I could launch him straight into that wall, full force. What seventeen and a half? What's what's that? From the, where, where you told me, I could where I, where the incident happened in my house. The day when you were oh, down the hallway, there, down the hall. You said I can launch him down that hallway full force, and he hit that wall. It's still not sustaining them injuries. But there's no way he would hit that wall with such force if you launched him down that 17 feet. He was so losing momentum. He, those. he didn't have he no bumps momentum on him. before he hit the wall. But I'm saying he didn't have no bumps on him. He didn't have no brakes on him. He didn't have no knots on his head. No nothing. So what could somebody have did to this baby for him to be like that? Well, there's, but y'all think there's, 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 there's numerous. There's numerous. But evidently, there was something else going on with it because he didn't have no lumps, no bruises, no nothing on him. There's numerous things that could have happened. Like what? Numerous things could have been shaken. Okay, but I heard that they did something on his spinal cord, and there was no. That's not there, true. His retinas were detached from his eyes. Then that's why they also did something for to his spinal cord to see if there was shaking there too, right? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Where, where did you hear this at? Tell me. Talk to me. From CPS. Okay, I do. The same it. ones that's, who that, that who has been involved with y'all and talk to prosecutors. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not familiar with, with CPS, with what they said. I don't know. But the information you just said, that they can tell if a, if a baby has been shaken or not by looking at the spinal cord. That's why they said that they was having something else done on his spinal cord to tell or if something he was else done on the spinal cord. To tell if he was shaken. Okay. Well, that's done through the eyes, okay? And his retinas were detached from his eyes. And you tell me out of all them kids that was running around the house, ain't nobody seen nothing. There are also two other injuries that was explained to me by the doctor. I, I, I'm, I'm not even going to try to, to even fake pronounce what these injuries are, okay? But there was two injuries. There was letters A through G, okay? For example, I don't even know if it went through G when it might have been more than G or, or before the letter G, okay? But on the board, okay? We hit, well, it, we pulled it up on the board in front of me, so I'll tell you how many letters there were. There's AAS past G. Okay, there's two, the one goes to K, actually one goes to I and the other one goes to G, okay? Mm -hmm. Out of this first group, there were two letters in here, okay? And right here, two letters that the doctor pointed out that said that it has, it has only occurred not only in Kalamazoo, but in the entire North of America, North America, okay? It has only occurred as a result of abuse. Two of these letters of these injuries, okay? And, I don't, and I'm not gonna try to tell you which ones they are, because I don't know, and, I'm gonna, and I don't remember. 
but they don't see it in car accidents, they don't see it in industrial accidents, farm accidents, they don't see it in anything, or dog bites, when a dog mauls a kid, they don't see it in anything except abuse cases causing death. That's it. That is it. And that's fact. So, something's gotta happen here. You see where we're coming from? How can we not act on that? Yeah, but, but y'all, the abuse is coming from my house, but why is all my kids okay? Why is all them kids okay? And I've been dealing listen, with them way longer than listen, any other kid. Listen. And can have other kids over there babysitting. All since Before this accident. Oh, okay. Okay. So, why I can't you I can't speak with the other kids. That's what I'm asking you. What's different? That's what's what's what happened different this day that they made That's what I'm saying. I don't put my hands on them. Well, I guess let me ask you a simple question then. This is a very simple one. Why did you say that you and him did not, neither he nor you fell down those stairs that day, the first time we talked to you, and then you changed it? Why did you change that? In the course of the interrogation, detectives delve into the second narrative provided by Bryant, where he claims to have fallen down the stairs while holding little Jason. The detectives strategically ask more detailed questions, aiming to uncover potential inconsistencies in Bryant's account. This meticulous approach is a common tactic to test the reliability of a suspect's narrative and identify any discrepancies. In a significant turn, the detectives share a crucial detail from the autopsy report, the detachment of the retina from Jason's eyes. This specific information serves as a powerful revelation, suggesting that the injuries sustained by Jason go beyond what could be attributed solely to a fall down the stairs. The detachment of the retina indicates a level of force or trauma that extends beyond the scope of a typical accident. Despite the gravity of this revelation, Bryant persists in denying his involvement. His continued denial in the face of specific details from the autopsy report becomes a point of interest for the detectives. It raises questions about Bryant's willingness to acknowledge the severity of the situation and the potential implications of the injuries sustained by Jason. So that day, was the baby crying excessively? That baby ain't never cried since he came to my house. You can even ask my wife when the time she was there babysitting. The baby ain't never cried. We have to sit up there and figure out what he want, if he's hungry or want a bottle or something. The baby would sit in the, in, in the, in the thing and just sit like this. He would never lay down, no nothing. And then for, and then you talk about a Bruce, and then for how, how, how you bring your kids over to a stranger house, your, old, your other son don't want to come upstairs with some strangers and you smacking him all this head in his face to get him to go with some strangers. But I'm the one that's a Bruce and the kids though, right? Don't, ain't nobody looking at none of that shit. Everybody pointing the finger at me because they, hey, she probably did this shit, then dropped them off onto me. And then the little shit that did happen, react to the, all that shit. We no, we yeah, we already talked to the, yeah, that's impossible. It's impossible. I'm sorry. It's imp I'm sorry. It didn't happen that way. That fall didn't trigger something else in the in the brain of this child. Didn't happen. And we asked. We, we that we, was specifically we, that was one of the first things we did. So hey, is, it, is it possible that this could be pre-existing? And, and, and then that fall right. triggered it. No, no. Sorry. So all these people you say can vouch for you about, you know, never raising your hand, never doing this and that, they can't vouch for you at this exact time. They weren't there with you, right? And again, another thing that's hard to believe, home alone with eight kids, not getting stressed. Not possible. Don't buy it. I mean, you're a human. Really? It, it would, yeah, it I just don't know me. No, yeah. I don't know anyone who wouldn't get stressed with eight kids, man. Come on. And you're in the house all day. All day. I don't know anyone that wouldn't get stressed about that. There's a difference between getting stressed and, and you know, going hog wild, but to say that you don't even get stressed about it, it's just a little hard to believe. So, when we present this report, it's already been presented to the prosecutor, when this case gets put in front of a jury or the judge, all right, there's a jury of your peers sitting there. This child is fine when he gets dropped off. Your cousin attests to that, girlfriend attests to that, mom attests to that. You say it falls 18 inches 
and or possibly even down the stairs with it, but you forgot about it, uh, don't know how it died. And what do you think the jury's gonna think about that? I mean, you think they're just gonna say, no, nah, he didn't have anything to do with it. I'm not saying they don't, but like I said, I got a whole lot of witnesses to prove my character though. Well, the character, character, character that witnesses I are, only, are only good, you know, they only take you so far. When we're presented, and that's, you know, what, what Bill and I look at, you know, we talk to you and we got your side of the story and, and you know, we wanted to believe that's you, of course. Like, I can have family members over there, they can tell you. We wanted to believe you, we Everybody have to go off the facts there. that are given to us in the case, right? And, and the facts are, you're there with the kid and the doctor's saying, hey, not possible the baby died from that. This is how the baby died. It's just, it's just the science behind it. So when that's presented in front of a jury, what do you, how do you expect them not to believe that? How, how can, I mean, we, we see a lot of different weird stuff. Uh, and so we can kind of, you know, make some leaps of judgment, but you know, when you're talking to, you know, a jury of people who don't normally deal with this kind of stuff, how do they, how does it explain to them that a baby dies? from this, how, 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 how can you rationalize? You know what I mean? How, I don't know, but, I, I, but, I, but I do believe that there was another case, something like this, where the dad had his daughter and just got his daughter. She died while she was in his custody. He, he go to prison for it. They say, oh, well, this happened and that happened and this happened to the baby. Come to find out, he get released because he didn't do the shit. Every, yeah, they come to find out. They can't different. find out that all that was already done. So how do this man go to prison for it and then come to come back to find out that he was telling the truth? I don't know the particulars on that case. We don't, we have no idea. Every, the baby was in his custody. Said he listen, beat the baby. Injuries, I had no idea on these injuries. Said he beat the baby. Said he even molested that baby. And then all of a sudden they come back that he was telling the truth about the Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, can't, I can't I, without, answer that. I didn't investigate that. Without seeing that, I don't know. It's impossible to say. I can just tell you what medical professionals... That's damn it like the same case that I'm in. I can tell you what medical His baby got dropped off to him. All of a sudden, his baby died in his custody. He got in trouble for that shit. He got found not guilty after he can been to prison for it. Um, you can probably look at 500 murder cases and every single case can have a different set of circumstances. Just because it's, you know, say you look at 500 murders where a husband killed a wife. There's gonna be differences, there'll be similarities of course, but there's a difference in every sure. single case. There's differences, sure. Manner of death, cause of death, what led up to it. There's just lots of differences. You know what I mean? Right. I'm I standing don't, up here on the chopping know. block right now for some shit that I really didn't do. And me and my family going through all of this shit and I didn't do nothing. Nothing. And I'm trying to rationalize, man. I am trying to rationalize. What else could have happened? That's what I don't get. Because did nothing happen. I didn't do nothing to the baby. And then for him to sit up there and say the force that was done to him, I know damn well what damn one of my kids could have did something like that. And then for you to sit up there and say a grown man like me can launch this baby 17 and a half feet down the wall and he hit that wall full force and still not sustain them injuries. Well, what the fuck did I do to that baby then? In the interrogation, Bryant adopts a strategic approach, attempting to deflect blame onto Jason's mother, presenting himself as a true gentleman. He expresses confidence that his family, known for their loyalty, will support his version of events. However, it's crucial to recognize that these assertions unfold in response to the relentless pressure created by the detectives through their questioning and cross-examination. The detectives effectively use fear as a tool to coax Bryant into a confession, emphasizing the potential consequences he may face. Bryant's response is just what the detectives are expecting. His anger and agitation are instinctive. He tries to simplify the incident, but in doing so, he overlooks the gravity of the child's death. This confirms to the detective that they are on the correct path, and Bryant unknowingly justifies their suspicions. The detectives leverage the psychological impact of discussing potential repercussions, making Bryant uneasy. This discomfort becomes evident in the reactions. In response to this reaction, the second detective intensifies the probing, seeking more intricate information about Bryant's involvement. This shift in the interrogation dynamics reflects a strategic attempt by the detectives to exploit Bryant's vulnerabilities and get a more detailed and potentially incriminating account. For him not to have no lumps, no bruises, no shit, what did I do?
I didn't do nothing to that baby. It didn't injure itself. I know I didn't do nothing to that baby. Then who do you think did? I have no clue. I've been sitting up there telling everybody. And it's even more, it's even her close friends to her to even think she doing shit to her kids. But I'm the one that's on the chopping block for this. Do you, so you think it's possible that he, that he did it to himself? No, for him to say the injuries that the injuries that he's sustained, how can he do it to himself? Right, and, it, and it's not. Even walk. I think you're, you know, maybe getting the wrong. I don't know if you're getting the wrong. But whatever. We're not the ones that are saying this is the amount of force. These are the doctors that are telling us. I'm not a doctor, nor is he. All right, it's just it's the information that's given to us. Hey, is the amount of is this amount of force? You know, is it possible the baby fell from 18 inches? No, nope, not possible at all. Okay, is it possible that uh, you know he fell down these you know, flight of steps? No, nope, that's not consistent with these injuries out there. Just like, you know, if someone got shot in the head, all right, is this injury consistent with a gunshot? Yes, sir. You know what I mean? There's there's certain things that are consistent with uh, injuries and, and just that's where the amount of force things coming into it. You know, that it took a good amount of force to cause these injuries. And you, the injuries were sustained while you were there. So any reasonable person's gonna say, okay, well, then he knows what happened to the baby. And he's the one responsible for whatever happened to JCM. I know I didn't do nothing to JCM. Every, every, like I said, everybody can tell you. I can have family members come over there and say, damn, how don't you hear this? Kids running around doing this and doing that. I let my kids be kids. I didn't have a childhood like that. So I let them do what they gotta do. If they not sitting up there murdering each other, breaking each other or fighting or something, then there's no need for me to step in. So when you fall down the stairs with, with Jason, did you think at all, but maybe I should call 911 or bring him to the hospital, get him checked out? Did you consider doing it? No. Okay. Did he act normal after that? Yeah, he was acting like his same so. Okay. And when you called or texted uh, his mother, did instead of, I just you know what I mean? Like, why didn't you just bring him to the hospital instead? So when he's acting strange, because one of the reasons, because when I sat up there and called the mama and told her that he was acting weird, she told me, "Don't worry about it. She was on her way, and if something was going on with him, she was gonna take him to the hospital." I know, but if I'm saying I'm watching your kids and something happens, so I don't, I don't care about calling you. If there's something wrong with the kid, I'm gonna get him to the hospital. I'll call you after I'm there. You know what I mean? So he's getting treated. Hey, here's what's going on, man. This is what happened, and here's where we're at. You know, I don't care what the mom has to say at that point. You know, if it, if it's something where it's bad enough you feel you need to call the mom and say, hey, your kid's acting like this, why not just bring him to the hospital? Or call for an ambulance. I realize you're there watching other kids, but you can call for an ambulance. The ambulance will come and transport them. You know, if transport's an issue. It didn't slip my mind. Okay. Like I said, he was crying. I didn't see no knots or bruises on his head or face or no nothing. So I was like, okay. The only time that I seen a bruise on his face was right here on his chin from when he got pushed off them damn stairs. And that was the only bruise I seen on him. He bruised that quickly? Get right off the stairs and bruised right away or? And I ain't seen no bruise on him all day and I've been changing his clothes and all of that. Changing diapers and everything. Ain't noticed nothing else on him. I looked up there, I even kissed him on his cheek a couple times. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you other than what what I what I already presented you with is, is what we're gonna have to you know and go forward with. And what the experts have documented in their report, their medical reports. 
So if there's something more, like like Bill said, if there's something more that slipped your mind that you didn't think about, like before when you didn't think no, about going down the steps. My wife sat there and she had brainstormed the shit out of me. Well, it, she it, it didn't happen to, when she brainstormed you, it didn't happen to uh, stir up the memory that you fell down the steps with him. Because did you know that I talked to her? Yeah. Okay. Did she ask you about it? Did yes, she stay by me? Sweat the hell I told her. And, but what would you tell her? Why didn't you tell her? Because it, it, I forgot. And she know how I forget. After being beaten your head with spade shovel and all that shit, remember some things you just, some things you forget and some things you That's don't. That's pretty significant though, Brian. It's pretty significant. Don't you think? Oh, I'm not being facetious here. I'm being serious. Don't you think that's kind of significant? It's quite an important piece to tell two weeks later and then never tell your wife until your wife is told in November. You didn't tell your wife for almost three months. And then I told her. No, actually, it was sooner than that. No, it wasn't. I'll tell you when I talked to her. I talked to her November 7th. Talk to her a couple different times too. Here yeah, I didn't. How often do you pass out? November 6th. In this section, Detective Mason strategically employs logic to present facts, aiming to uncover any inconsistencies from Bryant himself. Mason questions why Bryant, as the caretaker, didn't take Jason to the hospital immediately if he was aware of the injuries. This underscores the lapse in common sense for an adult responsible for multiple children. The observation suggests that an adult lacking the understanding of when medical intervention is necessary may not be adequately equipped for caregiving responsibilities. While it may seem like victim blaming, there's a shared responsibility, raising questions about Jason's mother's level of caution in the situation. As per Child Welfare Information Gateway, factors that increase the probability of child abuse encompass a history of child abuse, substance use, mental health issues, socioeconomic stress, limited parenting skills, insufficient comprehension of childhood development, stress, and other related factors. And nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. We're all human, Brian. Mm -hmm. We're all human. But when there's a mistake that's made, we try to, we gotta try to make the best out of it. All right? We gotta try to make the best out of the bad situation that it is and try to make it into, not, I mean, not that it could be made into a positive, but make the best that it, it can be, okay, for the person. And that's all we can do. That's all you can do right now. That's it. But if, if, if you lay out all the facts in the case and all of your responses in the case, it just, it, it doesn't add up. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. Me. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. Doctors will say that that kid didn't arrive injured like that. It couldn't have sustained seven hours, six hours like that. There's no way. There is no way. And then especially with at what time you, your cousin and his girlfriend were there at several hours after Jason was dropped off. And, and there's just no way that he would have been able to be acting even not even halfway normal, a little bit normal. It's just not possible. Not, it's just not possible. You know, the inside is, and it's hard for you to probably grasp it. You know why? Because there isn't and so much visible outside. It's, it's all inside, it's tough, you know? It's all inside. It's nothing you can physically see with your, with your eyes. That's a lot. Some people can't grasp that. I have a hard time grasping and stuff like that. Like until, I said, I got an autistic son with until I, until I see it on paper. Then and I cherish him. I ain't never did nothing to him. And he's still living. And he's... Well, thank God he's still and living. that's a baby. Thank God he's still living, you know? And we're not, we're not here talking about your autistic son, all right? We're here talking about JCN. And his four-year-old brother pushing him off of a step isn't going to is not going to trigger or cause the, the amount of injury that he had. It's just, otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if that was the case. If it was remotely possible, we're not gonna go stick our head, our necks out on the line here. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to anybody to do that. Okay? Nobody wants that. 
I would have been good with if they said that could have happened that way. I'd have been good with that. You never would have seen me again, Brian. You never would have seen me again. If the doctors would have told John and I that, if, that him being pushed off of even the top step, the third step, okay? Or is it two or three total? It's the total of two. Two. Okay, he was on the first. Then there's a second one to get up to, the, right? Okay, even if he was on the top step, the second step, okay? Not the first one, but the second one. If he was on that, pushed off, and the doctors would have said, you know what? He could have sustained these injuries as a result of being pushed off that step. I'd be good with that. John would be good with that. We wouldn't be sitting in here because it'd be deemed an accident. But when we're told by more than one medical professional that it's absolutely impossible that that happened that way, then what, what do we, what, how do we, how are we supposed to react? We wouldn't be doing our job, Brian. Wouldn't be doing our damn job if we were to ignore that. We'd be negligent in our job. And then it's also crazy how you say multiple examiners when you the one that sat up there and told me that one of them when he first was examined one of them said it could happen like that and then you also told me that the other one that the other one that's just why y'all was having another one come in and they said that um there's no way that it could have happened i'll explain it's like this. CBS explain. said there's a conflict of interest Listen there was me. a conflict of interest and in, and in what the medical examiners were saying because one was saying one thing and another one was saying okay. something different and i'll explain so this. what is that because i never said that to you brian it was CPS that told you that, okay? It wasn't me. You sat up there and told me Set that y'all was having me, that, me that she was having that y'all was having another another examiner coming in to examine him because ER doctors messed up all the time. You did sit up there and tell you, me that. I, no, ER doctors don't do the autopsy, Brian. I didn't say you did the autopsy. Okay. I'm saying that's the one that said talk that you talked to at the hospital. Okay, and 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 the remote the reason that there's multiple doctors there. Okay, I agree with that. ER doctors are different than pedi pediatric doctors. Okay, ER doctors see adults. They don't specialize in children. Okay. Yeah, and CPS was talking to the hospital and all this. And okay, all I can't that answer. Too. I cannot, I, just, and I won't I'm, answer I'm, for CPS. I'm just telling well. you what they told me. Okay. Like but, when in court, when we went to court, like they sat up there and told the judge, there's nothing that they can really do to me right now because one medical examiner was saying this, and the other was, one was saying something you're different. You're wrong there. there. You're wrong. It wasn't a medical examiner. Okay. It wasn't a medical examiner. There's only one medical examiner. Okay. Well, you're talking about you're well, talking about the, the courts and ask them what, you're talking what about the difference told. between the, e, the ER doctor and then the, the pediatrician specialist doctor. OK, he, he, he initially came in the ambulance to the ER where a general ER doctor, a, a general physician saw him. He's not equipped to deal with that. So then he then JCN got transferred to the pediatric intensive care unit. OK, the PIC, it's called the PICU, I believe. OK, that's where. Doctors that, that are specialized in pediatrician, pe pediatric care, are a team of them oversee him. And that is who I was seeing and who I was dealing with before he passed away, before he was pronounced dead, okay, and then they harvested his organs. I was dealing with them. And then after that, I was dealing with the pathologist who deals with him after he's dead, okay? That's a lot different than an ER doctor. An ER doctor is just a general physician he was not, he was not qu equipped to deal with this. So that's why he's immediately transferred to the PICU. All right. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you. In this segment, two intriguing dynamics unfold. While Detective Stoltzenberg tries to probe Bryant on moral grounds, it is not effective as Bryant's values and principles seem shallow so far. Further, Detective Stoltzenberg presents incriminating facts pointing directly at Bryant. What makes this section particularly interesting is Bryant's attempt to employ a tactic similar to what the detectives had used on him earlier. He cross-questions Detective Stoltzenberg about the reports being examined by multiple doctors, showcasing audacity and a degree of assertiveness. Bryant's audacious move to challenge the detective's information adds a layer of complexity to the interrogation. This observation underscores Bryant's attempt to shift the power dynamic in the conversation. On the other hand, Detective Stoltzenberg's patience and composed response in the face of Bryant's assertiveness is noteworthy. The exchange highlights a subtle power play, with both parties attempting to assert control and influence the narrative. Now, what CPS is talking to you about, I'm not going to answer for them, but they're prob I'm going to guess 
And, and, and they're talking about the damn ER doctor, but I don't know that for sure. I'm and just guessing. To all the doctors. I didn't have to go to court for none of this until they talked to all the other doctors. Okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll have to muggle through all that, okay? And but that's just like I'm just telling you. Court. That's all on records. I'm just they telling you. I'm there, telling you right now. Conflicts it. I talked to the I talked to the doctors. One of them saying this. One of them saying I talked to the pediatrician. I talked to the pet. One saying it didn't happen there. Right. And, and, and so, I already gave you a, a rational explanation that you don't want to hear it. Okay. And that's not on me. That's on you. I gave you a reason why that could have happened. Okay, now what if now what if they ain't talking about the ER doctor? Right. What if they talking about these other doctors? Then then we'll have then to what? We have yeah. all we have okay, we have the records from every we have every record for JCN that exists from the time he was born, okay? Oh. Up until his date of death. All right? We have everything. So there's no question. We have every record there is to have on it. All right? So if you what you're saying is true, it'll be in the records. But I was not conveyed anything that the doc, the, the, no doctor told me, okay, that whatever you were saying, he could have sustained that injury from falling from 18 inch step. Didn't happen. I'm told by more than one doctor that that didn't happen that way, okay? So that's, and I was, I'm trying to be decent with you and explain to you this, you know? I thought I was trying to be at least trying to, to lay this out for you and explain it. Like you said before, if that was the case, that they said, yeah, you know, it's, it's possible this child died in this manner, we wouldn't be here. It's that simple. Well, I don't know because CPS is damn near like y'all too. They sit up there and they've been doing their investigation too. And yeah. they've been keeping in contact with a lot of close people that I know too. And like they've been telling everybody, hey, they don't, the autopsy is not really saying anything. The only thing that they have to go on is the medical examiners. Because like they said, it, they'd have been took my rights from me and everything. Because the only thing that they were waiting for was the autopsy report to come back. I mean, if you if you want me to speak for CPS, I can. I know. I mean, and same, same with Bill, he can't either. I don't know what CPS is telling you, why they're telling you, where they're getting their information. They sure as heck have not been talking to me, right? I haven't talked to CPS at all about this. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what they have going on with, I don't know if it's something, if you're talking about they're trying to terminate parental rights to your other kids, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I don't know. I have no, to... that's what I'm saying though. When we right. went to court and they was asked about all that on in front of the little hearing judge over there. Yeah. They that's when they told him, Well, hey And how long they... ago was this though? What? A couple months ago? Like okay. three months ago? I, I don't know what court, information they have at like that they time. They said you know? like they came in there and they was talking about, yeah, well, hey, the autopsy report isn't really saying anything. So the only thing that we really have to go on is what the medical examiners are talking about. Had the medical examiner's report been done at that point in time? I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know what reports were available. What day? You said like three, four months ago. I don't know what reports were available to them at that time. I know from still, it's, I guess it's kind of. They kept, it's every not, time I talked to them, they was waiting on him. Who's yeah, not, yeah. It's not The CBS the, people was waiting on you yep. to get them copies of the, um, to let them see the autopsy report. And I was waiting on pathologists. Yeah, and like they came and they said, well, hey, the autopsy report isn't really saying anything. Because it was a preliminary one. The final one was done, I believe, in October. Let's see. Let's see if I can't tell by this to say this. I didn't mean to interrupt you, John. No, you're fine. I'm just trying to explain to the best I can about Yeah. Uh, but but it's hard to, you know, try to rationalize for someone else. I don't know what's CPS had going on. Right. What they're reading, it's not. We, we, yeah, we, and, and unfortunately, we, we don't really know their process, do we? Well, no, just because we work somewhat in conjunction with each other, but we, you know, they do their job, we do ours. You know, so I, I can't speak for them.
there a way I can have a cigarette because I'm finna go to jail anyway? I'll be honest with you. You gonna let me smoke a cigarette now? Hey, you don't have to be in the next room. I'll keep you in this room. We'll have to put you in another room later because I can't do it anymore. I can't sit in the smoke. Yeah, I know. I've done it for too long. Remember you said you Remember that? Yeah, I told you I would pay. I let you do that before, didn't I? Yeah. In another room? Yeah. I can slap you in another room. I don't have a problem with it. Cigarettes. Huh? Because the other officer brought me up here and had my cigarettes and everything. Oh, you? Oh, they're here? Yeah. Oh, I don't have to give you a stale one? No, you don't have to give me a stale one. All right. Yeah, let's do that. You, I, I, you do mind you, John. Oh, Unless you want to sit here and smoke with him. No. No, no, no. He can have a cigarette too if you want. Hello. Oh, I appreciate it. I'm smoking. No, but literally, I am a, I am a, all the kids love me. All the kids, not just my kids. I got nieces and nephews and everything, all, and little cousins who all want to come to my house. You know what, and I'm not gonna sit here and say that that's not true, it may be, but something happened that day. Something happened that caused that child to die. And you're the grown up that was there, so you know what it was? That's the point, I don't know what it was, cause I, the incidents that happened is the first one that was, the one that happened with me earlier that day. Which one's that? The one I fell down, that passed out and fell down the stairs waiting. Okay. And then the one with his brother pushing him off the stairs. That's the only incidents that I know that happened at my house. Okay. I can even sit up there, there and been locked up for the last three months sitting up there like brainstorming my goddamn self to see what, Junior, you sure that's all that happened? Is you sure? And there's nothing else that's running. And then everybody sitting up here, I'm getting phone calls from everybody talking about, hey, well, if you need us to come to court, you need my kids to come to court. Hey, we all willing to come testify on your behalf. Because mm -hmm. it's people, kids that's not related to me that wants to be at my house. Because I let kids do so much. I don't know if he's giving you your cigarette, actually. That's why I said it's, I got more than 50 some people who's willing to vouch for me. Uh, let me go find your stuff. You wanna come over here? And we'll hop into the video a little bit. Throughout the interrogation, Detective Mason maintains a calm demeanor, primarily observing while Detective Stolzenberg engages with Bryant. However, Detective Mason consistently intervenes to temper Bryant's assertiveness by posing rational questions. Whenever Bryant attempts to establish dominance, Detective Mason takes charge, confronting him with incriminating questions or highlighting the misalignment of his narratives with the available evidence and reports. In this final clip, despite not obtaining a confession, it becomes evident that Bryant has resigned himself to the idea of going to jail. Yet as a last resort, he attempts to defend himself. Given Bryant's behavior and personality, it was anticipated that he would deny any involvement. However, the detectives in this interrogation have made substantial observations that could serve as crucial evidence in court. These observations not only hold the potential to implicate Bryant as the perpetrator, but could also be grounds for a more extended sentence. On February 28, 2018, Bryant was arrested on one count of felony murder and one count of first-degree child abuse. Initially found guilty by a 12-member jury on November 21, 2019 of first-degree murder and one count of first-degree child abuse, Bryant was sentenced to life in prison without parole on December 16, 2019. In December 2020, Bryant was granted a new trial due to his attorney, Keith Turpel, being found to have provided ineffective counsel, thereby denying Bryant his 6th and 14th Amendment rights. The court determined that Turpel failed to make sufficient efforts to secure the assistance of a medical expert specializing in abusive head trauma, the cause of J.C. and Downey's death. Bryant later pleaded no contest on November 28, 2022, a week before a jury trial was scheduled to start. On January 3, 2023, he was sentenced to 12 and a half to 40 years in prison by Kalamazoo County Circuit Judge Paul Bridenstine. Despite the judge granting him credit for five years in prison, the sentencing raises concerns about justice for the baby, who tragically didn't have the opportunity to experience a fair portion of life. I trust him in his care. I should have been able to pick my son up that night, but then 
happy, healthy, and loving baby he was. And said, you failed. You failed to keep my son safe. You failed me. You are sick in the head, and I hope you suffer fully in person, in prison, mentally and physically every day, because that's what you deserve. My son will be 11 months old forever, and that's all I have left of him. It's pictures and memories and videos and dreams I may have here and there when I should still have my son. I wish you opposite of the best that you enjoy. As we wrap up this intense interrogation journey, it makes you think about how tricky it is to find the truth. The detectives did their best to uncover the lies, but it also raises some big questions. How well does the legal system handle cases which are children and where things aren't always straightforward? How can skilled detectives employ their tactics when dealing with such arrogant, remorseless, and aggressive suspects as Bryant? Lastly, what can we learn from this case about making sure justice is served even when evidence is not enough? What do you think could have been done differently to serve justice to the little baby? Add your thoughts and more case suggestions in the comment section below. If you want us to cover more such cases, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.